Hi, I'm Michelle Jackman and today I'm excited to tell you about new guidelines that we hope will change the lives of children and young people with cerebral palsy from across the globe. A number of years ago, the international cerebral palsy community, including people with cerebral palsy and their families, as well as clinicians and researchers, came together to identify key areas that would make the biggest difference to the lives of children and young people with CP. One priority was how to improve functional goals, things like walking, getting dressed or playing basketball. Let's hear from Ivy, a 10 year old visionary with cerebral palsy about what's important to her, as well as her mum Michelle commenting on the importance of having readily available information about intervention options. I'd like to be a, either a surgeon or a drama teacher and I'd like to have a whole house controlled by Siri. It's really so difficult I'm... to navigate all of the information that's out there. I think it's really important that we do research as a parent ourselves. A team of researchers, in consultation with experts from across the world, have collated the evidence regarding therapy interventions and combined this with information on accessibility and cost effectiveness, with the preferences and values of children and young people to come up with guidelines to improve function for children and young people with CP. So after this rigorous guideline process, we can tell you that effective interventions have a number of key ingredients. Asking the person with cerebral palsy what is important to them and setting goals that are focused on these things. No longer is it best practice about therapists telling children and young people what they should do. It's about to them telling us what we can help them with. Sometimes children and families find it hard to set goals as this might be a new concept for them. So therapists might need to dig a little deeper or use goal setting tools to help. After setting the goals, clinicians should observe the person attempting their goal. This will help to figure out what can help. This is a bit different from what, how we may have done it previously, as we might have first looked at underlying strength and range of motion, for example, but we now know it's important to consider factors such as the task and the environment, rather than just focusing on underlying impairments. Intervention should then focus on practice of the whole goal. So if the goal is to be able to ride a bike, you get out there on your bike and start practicing, rather than working on leg strength or balance skills first. Sometimes you might need to break the goal down into part task practice, but the priority where possible should always be on practicing the whole goal because research tells us that this is the most efficient way to achieve the goal. The intervention should be fun, enjoyable and challenging. If interventions are painful or distressing, they should be modified or alternative interventions considered. Where possible, practice should occur within real life environments. So if a person's goal is to be able to get out of bed and into their wheelchair, you should practice this on their own bed with their own wheelchair. This isn't always possible, so the environment may need to simulate real life as much as possible. And the clinician should discuss with the person and their family when practice can be undertaken at home, school or within their community. Parent delivered intervention can supplement face to face therapy and clinicians can support this by coming up with a home program plan in conjunction with the family that is realistic for their individual situation. Children and parents should be empowered to make their own decisions. Clinicians should share their knowledge and expertise and spend time building trust and a strong relationship. To be effective, interventions need to be practiced a certain amount. This amount will depend on the individual and how complex the goal is, but it's important to consider how much practice will be needed and whether this is realistic for families when making a decision about whether a specific intervention is best. Finally, a team approach can decrease stress on families. Children and families should be key members of the team and all clinicians involved, even if they don't work within the same facility, should communicate to ensure everyone works towards common goals. The general recommendation is that a child works towards no more than three goals at any one time. In addition to these nine key ingredients, there are specific types of interventions that have been shown to be effective. To improve walking, overground walking is effective. And if there is a treadmill available, this can be used to increase the amount of walking practice. General mobility training, sit to stand training and habitual may also be effective interventions for mobility and gross motor goals. For hand skills, there may be effective intervention options that you can consider. These include by manual therapy, habit or habitiel, constraint induced movement therapy, goal directed therapy or the co-op approach. An algorithm has been included within the guideline to help with decision making. When self care goals are set, functional interventions such as goal directed training, co-op or habit are effective and the option of adaptive equipment should be considered to increase independence. 
For leisure activities such as playing sport or going to the playground, goal-directed interventions should be combined with addressing any environmental, personal or social barriers that may be impacting on participation, as is done in the Participate CP and PrEP approaches. The full guideline is published within Developmental Medicine and we have developed information sheets for clinicians and families that are freely available. The links are on screen now and should be available in the appendix of the full paper. Thanks so much.